supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen but it does happen. he's gonna race All right, good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with the science advisor, Matt Moniz, and uh, the silent assassin, Matt Costa, cannot be here tonight. He's actually working late, so joining us instead is Andrew Lake of Greenville Paranormal Research. He's here. How are you tonight, Andy? Doing fine, Tim. Well, we're very excited for tonight's show because we talk a lot about paranormal reality shows here, and uh, that's something that uh, we've... I've kind of had a roller coaster relationship with these shows in the past uh, six years now that we've been doing this program. So it's going to be interesting tonight to kind of step back to the beginning of some of these shows and to kind of get into the core root of why America is so obsessed with them. Uh, with our guest tonight, Deanna Kelly Saeed, whose book is called Paranormal Obsession. And I know a lot of people who are obsessed with the paranormal. And I know a lot of people who have the paranormal obsessed with them. So uh, we're going to talk about all that and more. And, of course, we welcome your calls during the course of the evening as well. Uh, the phone lines will be open, 1-877-996-1420, 508-996-0500. You can also join us online. If you go to our website, SpookySouthCoast.com, you can actually check out Spooky TV, which is our in-studio camera setup. And uh, hopefully, even though I'm doing Matt Costa's job tonight over here, I'm hoping I can switch the cameras a little bit more often, a little more often, because we do have like three or four cameras in the studio, so you can see what's going on. We also have our chat room there as well, where the discussion gets very interesting. Sometimes it's on topic, sometimes it's not, but it's a good time for everybody. And I know that the people in the chat room are going to have a lot to say about tonight's show, because a lot of people wouldn't be involved in the paranormal if it wasn't for these paranormal reality TV shows. And I'm not slighting anybody for that. To some people, it meant they felt more accepted doing it. To other people, it meant maybe it's their chance to get on TV. So we're going to talk about all that and more with Deanna Kelly Saeed, who we'll bring on in just a second. But uh, before we do that, I just want to ask you guys, you know, what's what's been going on? I know that you guys have been doing a lot of uh, investigations. Uh, Moniz, I know you, for one thing I've been meaning to ask you about is there is all those strange sounds that people have been hearing. And I actually got a message on Facebook from somebody who heard them yes. and wanted me to, to ask if that was anything uh, anything to that yet. Uh, there's been a number of reports around the world that's been recorded. As a matter of fact, I've even got a report of it happening in Wareham in a couple of weeks ago at like 2.20 in the morning. And uh, uh, there's a number of different theories. Some people blame you know tectonic stress. Some people say it's... Uh, uh, a result of the uh, solar flares that we've got going that have been creating some sort of uh, disturbance in the upper atmosphere and making things resonate, you know. And it, it, there's people blaming, you know, the U.S. government. It's a harp device. And, yeah, I mean, aliens. It, it, you take your pick. <laughs> well, it's something that we'll definitely uh, keep an eye on and, and an ear on, too. Uh, but uh, have you guys been working on any uh, investigations lately? I know that there was some stuff going on uh, that was kind of off the record in Wareham uh, that Andy had posted some yeah. some photos from. But is, has, has that still been ongoing? Yeah. Um, uh, Matt said uh, there's a possibility we may be able to go in for a third time into this home. We've been there a second time with uh, Mike Markowitz. Uh, Mike got a, a few things, uh, but nothing nothing rock solid like he has in the past. So uh, we're keeping an eye on that location. And how's your book been going, Ghost Hunting Southern New England? Uh, it's doing good. It's doing good. Um, um, I'm already researching uh, a, a second book, hopefully. I was just uh, out in uh, Connecticut. Uh, I was out in Bolton Notch looking for the ghost train and uh, taking photographs uh, out that way. 
and so when when do you think the second one might be coming out? Is it oh, coming? don't don't know. Don't, I've talked to my uh, editor about it. He thinks it's a good idea. So I'm just trying to make it happen now. A lot of research. It's, yeah. uh, it's going to cover a lot of ground. And and people don't realize how much you put years of work into ghost hunting. Yeah, yeah, right? it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not easy, but it, it is a lot of fun if you're passionate about the subject. Well, and we are here, and we know that our audience is as well. Uh, so we're going to talk to our guest. Uh, tonight, Deanna Kelly Saeed about paranormal obsession and about a lot of topics within the field. Uh, Deanna Kelly Saeed is an American Muslim author, global citizen, and cultural commentator. Born in rural American South and raised as a Southern Baptist, Deanna is now a Muslim. As a former UN spouse, she lived and traveled throughout the Muslim world, Central Asia, and Africa. Her work has appeared in Foreign Policy and Focus and various international magazines. While in the Middle East, she wrote for two English language lifestyle magazines and has written on topics such as foreign policy, weight loss, and creative fiction, and of course now writing about the paranormal as well. She also writes decidedly non paranormal related literary, literary short stories and creative non fiction. Most of her writing, regardless of the genre, is ultimately tied to narratives of identity and belonging. In her second book, So You Want to Hunt Ghosts, A Down-to-Earth Guide, will be released in October of 2012. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to bring her on to talk about the first book here, Paranormal Obsession, and it's America's Fascination with Ghosts and Hauntings, Spooks and Spirits. So good evening, Deanna. Thanks for joining us. There we go. I think that might work a little better. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us? I now? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, these uh, these buttons are all outdated. If you th if you think that uh, you know the the paranormal is uh, taking over the media, let me just say that it's not coming nearly enough to taking over the media here at our radio station <laughs> because they haven't replaced these buttons for us. <laughs> well, that's okay. You know, we will we will fear you on nonetheless this evening. Well, one question that I want to ask you, and at first glance of the book. It, mm -hmm. It's something that stood out to me, and I'm not sure, <clears throat> excuse me, if it was intentional, uh, but I'm going to hold it up here for the cameras and Spooky TV, but the book Paranormal Obsession, when you look at the, the logo, the lettering of the title of the book, the letters, you know, I'm sure it was to give it kind of a, a freaky effect, but I noticed the letters M and E are very prominent in That's that. Right. And is that. Is there a hidden message in that? Is there a hidden meaning to the fact that me stands out of Paranormal Obsession? Well, I did not design the cover, but you were only the second person to to brought that up. And I tend to think there must be something subliminal in the whole thing. I also see the emphasis on the end, so I see men. <laughs> no, that's true, and there is an emphasis in that in the paranormal, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, but yes, you're, you're right. There's a big me in the title, and then there's also this, this TV in there, too. So, um, very good. You're very observant. So that is that is not actually a picture of Carol Ann Freeling in the television, though. So, I I don't know. It I might be that girl from The Ring. Well, that could very well be. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> excuse me. You've been writing about a lot of different topics over the years, and in a lot of different publications. And I know that you got into the paranormal world uh, in in the two thousands. We'll talk about that a, a little bit later on. But what made you decide to actually chronicle America's obsession with the paranormal? Well, as you said, I've written on a lot of things, but I also became a paranormal investigator as well, and I was, you know, in that world. I was with the Tapp family, actually, and I also have a background, a little bit of an academic background in cultural theory and popular culture studies, where what we look at and what we appreciate in entertainment culture as a society actually says something about who we are <laughs> and you know academics really study these things and they have college classes on certain things like Madonna and Lady Gaga and other types of entertainment aspects and no one had really looked at the phenomena of, of paranormal reality TV mm -hmm. and what it was saying about American society in general we know what it's done to the paranormal community in both good and bad ways but no one had really taken a popular cultural studies approach to this and being someone in in the community and with this academic background I, I really wanted to explore this and it was also a way for me to understand why I felt so compelled to do this was was there any particular moment though uh, in your own viewing habits and your own investigation <clears throat> excuse me in your own interaction with the paranormal community where you said eh, this has really reached maybe the saturation point Oh, well, um, I keep thinking that's going to happen, but I, I tell you, it just keeps 
going and going and going. And what it is now isn't really, in my mind, and, and people may disagree with me, it's not what it was even a few years ago, mm-hmm. and even 10 years ago or 12 years ago when the whole paranormal reality TV boom started to occur. Um, it, it's changed. It's going through so many incarnations, and it's done, done it so quickly. I mean, that's my assessment. I could, you know, other people have may have different experiences, but even... Uh, you know, it's just changing demographics so fast. What, what interests me the most about it, too, is the fact that it's it's actually had quite a bit of staying power if you mm-hmm. look at it under the, the, the microscope of reality television because, you know, Ghost Hunters is in, like, what, its seventh season, something like that, sixth season? So they're filming their eighth season. And, and some of these other shows, you know, Paranormal State had a good run. Ghost Adventures mm-hmm. has been on a good run. So this is really a pretty long shelf life for a reality television show. I mean, Survivor stopped drawing in monster ratings after a few years, and, you know, these big uh, game shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, they're, they kind of have their flash in the pan moment. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, the ghosts are here to stay. It is quite amazing, you know, that these shows are resonating with the public, and I, I assume that there's still shows in development in some form or fashion around this concept. I know there are. So, yeah, I think, and I talk about this in my book, that in terms of reality TV, I mean, let's be honest, it is sort of the lowest common denominator of of entertainment offerings Mm -hmm. on TV. But what paranormal reality TV does that no other reality TV allows is really, it gives us an opportunity to address really large philosophical questions in a very accessible way. And I talk about that in my book, and I think that's one reason we're really drawn to it. It's not just the creepy factor of the fact that there are ghosts and there's some weird EVP and someone gets touched, um, because we know that these shows are they're, they're TV, they're packaged in a certain way to make it appealing to the viewer, but it's allowing us to really go into a lot of larger issues about life after death and good and evil and our place in the world that you're just not going to get from Jersey Shore or the Kardashians. Well, you, you know, you, you made a good point there. That we understand that it's packaged for television. And something that mm-hmm. I think is going to come up probably a lot in our discussion tonight is, yes, we do. And by we, I mean the three guys sitting here in the spooky studio and yourself on the phone mm-hmm. and those within the paranormal community that have kind of developed a, a buffer zone between what they see on television and what they do in the field. But I think for a lot of people, a lot of the common folk that are out there that are watching these shows that don't pick up an EMF detector and a camera and go out and do this themselves, they don't realize that it's it's being created for television. They think that's what it is. They think if I go ghost hunting, I'm going to be, you know, 12 minutes into it and say, what was that? Well, that's exactly what they do when they go ghost hunting. That's exactly what some paranormal <laughs> investigators do when they go out in the field. That's exactly what they do, and that's really not um, research. Mm-hmm. But, again, you know, now we have this very interesting dynamic where not everyone's going out to do research. I think 10, 12, 15, 20 years ago, people actually probably shared very similar motivations, even if they differed in philosophy. You don't have that anymore. You have your legend trippers on one end, which is fine. And, you know, you have your serious scientific researchers on the others, and you have client-based investigators. And, you know, it's, it's really a free-for-all now, and that could be good or bad. Well, and part of that, though, is you, you mentioned the legend tripping. And uh, I remember doing a story for the Standard Times a few years ago. Uh, it was, I think we had it up on the SpookySouthCoast.com site as well. It's called The Thrill of the Chill. And mm-hmm. it was the idea that a lot of people who are going out and doing this are just fear junkies. They're people who the, – the fight or flight response in the human body is going to create more of a natural high than pretty much anything else we can do. And you runners can tell me about endorphins all you want. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you're running for fun, it's nowhere near as exhilarating as running because you're afraid for your life. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that people want to experience an actual ghost the same reason they want to go out and see a really good horror movie. Some people. Mm-hmm. And those are, those are a lot of these fringe people who get involved in the paranormal who are in it for that fright and not for the science. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm okay with that if somebody can say, I just want to go out and get scared. Mm-hmm. And if people want, you know, if, that's, if they can be upfront and honest with that, I'm like, go right ahead. 
But unfortunately, I think what's happening is people feel the need to, to represent whatever they're doing in a, certain, in a couple of ways. One is, oh, we're, we're doing science. Or, you know, we just want to help people. And there are, very, there are really legitimate investigators out there who are doing real research and who are helping clients. But now you hear everyone using these buzzwords, and then they go into a client's home, and they will run out of the home screaming, you know, <laughs> yeah. at the slightest thing. And then the client of the homeowner is incredibly scared, and everyone, then these other, you know, you'll see this footage up on YouTube because they're pretending they're ghost adventurers. So it's created, you know, one thing reality, paranormal reality TV has done um, there are many, many incredibly positive things that it has done, but one thing, it's created quite a mess on, in some regards. Sure. Well, I, I do think that the one overall good thing that it's done is that it's raised public awareness for the paranormal actually being part of, you know, to some degree, it's part of everyday life. You know, it may not happen yeah. every day, but there's no reason to think that's what ha what's happening should be outside of the realm of the human experience. Mm -hmm. So it has raised awareness in that regard. I don't think it's really converted a lot of skeptics, though. No, probably not. But what it might be doing, and, and this might be something that we will see more in 10 years down the road, it, it might be opening up new discussions within research communities, within academic communities and scientific, um, the scientific um, part of academia to start talking about some related issues with more, in, in some seriousness. For example, consciousness studies. And, I mean, this is a, a topic we're going really um, to a different realm here, but how, you know, there are people who might now look at consciousness and its role in experiencing or creating paranormal events at some, you know, at some point in the future where they might not have done that if there wasn't a public, dis if there wasn't some sort of public discussion around it. So mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to see somewhere down the road how entertainment culture and public enthusiasm for these topics will influence academic culture. Well, the good part about, you know, being able to, to take a step back and analyze you know, America's obsession with the paranormal mm -hmm. currently is that you were able to put it through the filter of history and yeah. to, to take a step back, you know, to spiritualism and to even before then and to say, you know, here are other examples of when there has been this rise in the paranormal. And do you see these being kind of cyclical, the way that uh, America becomes fascinated with the other side? Yes, I, I do believe so. And I'm not the first person to notice that. I mean, People have commented that during times of profound social change or um, social and cultural insecurity, people tend to retreat back into these type of topics. And we saw it with the Civil War and the rise of spiritualism, and again with um, in, in America's history with World War One and World War Two. And now, of course, we are at a, a moment. There's a lot of uncertainty in in a post-9-11 society, which is one reason I theorize that people responded to these shows so well. It's because we needed, we needed to have the dead to speak at this point in history. Well, what is but, it, I was going to say, what is it about that 9-11 moment that, that made it this be the point? Well, these, the, uh, from what I understand from my research that I conducted for the book, um, production companies were looking into this concept before 9-11 because of the success of Most Haunted in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then 9-11 happened, and many production companies felt, you know, this is just not the appropriate moment to start talking about ghosts and the dead because it was a very horrific. You know, 9-11 was the most horrific thing we had ever experienced on our soil, and then we had our men and women in the military going to war, and this was just many production companies didn't feel it was, was time. And but a year or so later, I think we needed that. We were a very different society at that point. We had shifted so so completely after nine eleven that we needed a comfortable and accessible way to talk about these issues, to talk about good and evil. Because now the rhetoric of war really became about good and evil. To find a way to allow the dead to speak and. I think after 9-11, we really started to look inward as a society, and what these shows allowed us to do is to look at our own smaller histories, our local histories, our community histories that many of us have n had never engaged before. And that's one of the gifts these shows have, they've really provided us, is re-engaging re history in our own communities. And paranormal investigators 
are very instrumental in that, I think. Well, I, I know that there's been a lot of discussion uh, amongst ourselves here on the show and with past guests about 9-11 being that uh, pinpoint moment where mm -hmm. people were able to uh, open themselves up more to saying, uh, yes, this did happen to me and it could have been paranormal instead of just saying, oh, this weird thing happened mm -hmm. to me, but it was nothing. So it allowed our minds to kind of accept the idea of it being a paranormal experience more than ever. But, you know, I say even beyond that, 2004 was the moment where we could really start saying that mm -hmm. when when Ghost Hunters premiered and then all of a sudden it was like, OK, you know, if these guys are out there chasing after this stuff and they're going to be on television doing so, then I guess it's okay for me to publicly acknowledge that I had it. And almost, yeah. you know, the cool factor of ha saying, yeah, that's happened to me too. Yeah, and that's, I think that is one reason Ghost Hunters really did so well. It's, you had everyday normal people, I mean, plumbers, for goodness sakes, doing this in what seemed to be a very rational, systematic approach. And they were going into everyday normal people's homes and these people were saying, you know, we have stuff going on in our house. And what was so great about Ghost Hunters, especially in that those first two, three seasons, is there was an, there seemed to be an equal emphasis on also debunking. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found to be so fascinating, is all of these things happening. You could put the, the pieces of the puzzle together that would turn out to be something very normal. And that, to me, was equally as fascinating as finding a really freaky EVP during an investigation. I well, mean, it was a process. You know, it was this, the process of deductive thinking that I, f I felt was very valuable. And you mentioned, uh, you know, and I just want to throw this out here because uh -huh. uh, we, we feel like we always need to qualify when we start talking about these shows to say that yeah. we, we know a lot of these people off That's camera. Right. We're friends with a lot of these people. We respect them as people and we respect what they do. But we are going to speak freely about the way that these shows have progressed as well. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that first couple of seasons of Ghost Hunters, and I think what worked for that is you had an already established crew, people who already knew each other and already had a comfort level of investigating together and hung out off camera, which they showed. Mm -hmm. uh, you had that everyday blue-collar mentality to everybody that was on the show. And I think what's even more of a key is you had a lot of private residents residences with private residents who wanted mm -hmm. to have help. So it was a show that was about people helping people. It was a show about people getting along and working together. It went beyond just the ghosts that you hope to see in an episode. You're right. And it I, was about people's personal stories. It, it, exactly. And what happened was in later episodes, and I, my, my, the, where I put my finger on the thumb, where I put my thumb on it is uh, when we had the episode where our, our friend Brian Harnwa got into it with the group over his current girlfriend and they wanted him to take time out of the group. And when they started playing up, when that, when that drama started happening and the fans started eating that stuff up, that's when you started to see more of that interplay uh, coming about. And then now all of a sudden the cast to the common viewer looks like they're just stunt casting now almost. You know, they're bringing in mm -hmm. pretty young girls, not knowing the story about how these pretty young girls have been working their butts off to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing in special guest stars because, hey, sci-fi wants to prom cross promote and, you know, all this stuff that's going on. I think it lost a lot of that charm that it had in the first couple of seasons. I would tend to agree in that there's almost a bittersweet feeling when I look at those first seasons and look at it now. And as you said, we, we do know these people on the shows and... I have a lot of respect for Jason and Grant, and but there's a sadness for me as an investigator and as their friend. There's a sadness to see how the show has progressed. And I do want to point out that most of the viewers, you know, we in the paranormal community tend to see everything through our lens, but mm -hmm. most of the viewers who watch these shows have nothing to do with the paranormal community. They are just viewers. They watch it. They experience the show. And that's all they do. They may not even be aware of how vibrant and complex the current paranormal community is. We tend to forget that. Well, and also what it is, too, is to those common people that are watching it, they might not be upset about some of these same things that we're looking at. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're not going to care so much about the group dynamic. No. And they haven't investigated these properties on TV like some of, some of us have. You know, I mean, they don't have that same type of knowledge that we do. They don't see it as we do. And, and you're right. You know, we understand 
For example, you know, when you do go on an investigation, we, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't sit around and, and whisper, did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> but if, but they have to, they have to provide a narrative for the, for the viewer. And, you know, it just doesn't, it's just a different reality. It's a, it's a TV show. You know, and it's, it's easy to sit here and kind of armchair quarterback what's being mm-hmm. done on paranormal shows, and especially with Ghost Hunters, because everybody's like, well, if they had done this, it would have been better. Well, as far as yeah. they're concerned, as far as sci-fi is concerned, and Pilgrim Films and everybody involved, there isn't a way to do anything better. It's one of the top mm-hmm. ratings getters on cable. So there is no way to do better. They've been doing it that way. But, you know, it would have been nice to have seen, you know, more of the private residences. And I know you automatically have the built-in problem now of who just wants to get on TV and who's actually yeah. having a problem. Yeah. and But it doesn't help, and I'm going to say that we're guilty of this because we run a company called Legend Trips, Jeff and I, where <laughs> you know we're taking people's money to go into haunted locations, but it, it seems convenient that they go and they investigate Fort Mifflin, and then you know a week later they're doing an event at Fort Mifflin. And it seems you know you're not really helping to fight that uh, you know, 2008 controversy of the moving jacket uh, mm-hmm. on the live episode when it's always Jason and Grant investigating together. You know, nobody's ever with yeah. them to to see. You know, and you know, in a, in a group like that, how would that ever work in an actual paranormal group that the two main people in charge of the group always stay together and everybody else is kind of left on their own? Especially mm-hmm. when they bring in a new investigator, like when you see Joe Chin involved in his first investigations and captured on television, they wouldn't leave him to go out and work with somebody else. They'd want to work with them themselves. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, we we know that. And you brought up a very good point. You know, Ghost Hunters and and all of these shows, the the job of these shows is to be a successful show. Yes. That is what they're supposed to do, and they do it very well. Um, It's not to depict paranormal investigation as it really is. That's not their job. They don't have a responsibility to that. And I I know we sometimes see the shows and, and what happens... We take it very personally, particularly if we happen to know the property where they're investigating. Yes. Um, we take it quite personally. But I have had to draw, you know, intellectually put this in a different space, put it in a different space and understand what it is. And at the same time, you know, even as a TAPS family investigator who knows Jason and Grant, you know, there there are very different discussions that occur when you're, with them talking about real investigation. Mm-hmm. It's completely two different spaces. Yeah, and of course, I'm playing devil's advocate to some degree here, I too. I know that, yeah. And uh, I've also just decided to draw that line in the sand myself mm-hmm. and to say, listen, I'm not going to get so worked up about this stuff anymore. It's television. You know, my son's seven years old, and he saw me reading your book this week, and he's asking me about it, and I'm trying to explain to him, and he's like, well, are those TV shows real? And I said, well... Yes and no. The same mm-hmm. reason why any TV show is, you know, as much as people don't want to believe it, you know, we found out recently, Jersey Shore, scripted. You know, there is a narrative, there is story elements that have to be covered in this. And, you know, whether or not these people who are involved in these shows are playing along wittingly or not, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm going to just say, like, the only ones who are really not blameless in the idea of how the show is conducted is Ghost Adventures. And having seen it firsthand, you know, these guys are the ones that are out there filming it. They're doing it themselves. So they're responsible for the narrative. And I don't mean blameless like there's something to blame them for. I'm just saying they're the only ones that can say, hey, we're the ones that have the complete control of this because they're filming it. They're editing it. They're the ones that are producing it. So Mm -hmm. they have a direction. Everybody else is kind of just subject to whatever the, you know, the producer is telling them would be the best thing. And so they may have to, you know, go back into the room again and and do that entrance Mm -hmm. again. And they may have to do some of that stuff. And it's just part of television. It is, and I have to say this, and I do talk about this a little bit in my book, that, and I don't want to represent any particular cast member that you see on TV, but having talked to many of them off record, it, w- it, it, it was not easy. You know, the first couple of years, and, and not just one show, there's a couple of shows, cast members from a couple of shows, it was not easy to have to contend with this. It, it really, you know, it's something that, one had to mentally and emotionally deal with. Mm-hmm. And we think, you know, we, we think, oh, yeah, they've made all their money and they're just sitting high. And, yeah, of course, their life has changed. And, but there's been a lot of compromise in that, too. 
Yeah, but there's also, there's some degree of false modesty to a lot of this, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have a lot of, and I'm not going to name any names, but you have a lot of people who have said, you know, you know, my life has changed. I didn't really want it to change. And it's like, you know, you knew what was happening when you signed up for it. You want to say Jason and Grant kind of skate that line a little bit because, you know, they did turn down offers and they did finally do what they thought was the right fit to help promote the field. And... You know, they can keep saying that they weren't comfortable doing that for the first couple of years, but when you're filming season eight, you must be pretty comfortable with it by now. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, certainly people have pointed out that at this point, many of these personalities are no longer investigators, they're entertainers. Mm -hmm. And that might be a fair assessment. And, and I think what's happening is we're seeing a trend amongst these cast members to kind of be willing to admit that, you know, to say, hey, look, yeah, I'm on a TV show, you know, and you have great quotes from Grant Wilson in the book where he talks about that. He's like, you know, mm -hmm. who I am as an investigator isn't necessarily what you're going to see on the television show, but we try to make it that way as much as we can. Yeah. And what I find to be particularly interesting, and, and I've struggled with this too, and I'm, I mean, I'm not on a TV show and I'm not even well known, but I have to do public events on occasion. And in fact, I have to do more of these public things than I do real field investigation. Mm -hmm. And I miss going out in the field. I miss having that experience. It's a very different a very different mindset when you have to go lead a public investigation and when you go do a real one in someone's home. It is satisfying in a very different way. And I miss that. I miss having to be having that, that moment, which is a, kind of a, a quiet moment when you get to go do a real investigation. I feel sometimes that I have to perform if I'm doing a public event. If I feel that way, imagine how people who are far better known than I am, how it must impact them on a daily basis. Sure. And, um, yeah, in a sense, you know, uh, because there's so much of this is public, once you do go public in any capacity, whether you write a book or you get a TV show or whatever, you almost have to sacrifice the meaningful stuff that you got when you first came into the field. You know, that excitement and going out on the investigation and being able to explore new equipment and new techniques, you know, that almost takes a, a back seat, and, and that's sometimes very sad. But what, what does happen, though, is that some of the people who are able to have those opportunities... Uh, they have them because they have the right skill set, the right personality, the right presence mm -hmm. to be able to represent the field in that manner. You know, I mean, I don't want to sound like we're anything more important than we are, but, you know, yourself, ourselves, you know, we're articulate people. Well, actually, I'll use them myself and the Matt Moniz dynamic a little bit here. My co-host, Matt Moniz, mm -hmm. you know, he kind of got dragged kicking and screaming to having a microphone in his face and he does some media things when he feels like it'll be beneficial but he's not like me i'll you know if anybody calls and i can fit it in my schedule i'll find a way to do it because i know it's going to help the field matt mm -hmm. knows that his contribution to the field is more valuable you know to be out there investigating and then to pass information on to me for me to present it to people i mean it's just everybody has their skill set it just so happens that these tv investigators can be that ambassador for for the field yeah, you, that's a nice way to look at it. When you see everyday investigators and just people who get into it and then suddenly they're invited to speak at their local library and, and so on and so forth. You know, now every, every group, and you will know exactly what I'm talking about, so many groups have to talk about their public dynamic um, as opposed to what they do privately as investigators. You know, 15 years ago, you were a paranormal group. You just worried about your case management and you know, have, finding the, the most effective way to deal with clients and evidence review, and that's a huge part of it. You know, I love that part of it. I, take, I find it to be incredibly, incredibly valuable. But now groups are focusing on, well, you know, our logo design and our T-shirt. Yep. And, and I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's like you have to, it's like this whole other side of PR work just to have a little local investigative team when I'm not, I'm not so sure, you know, how much investigating really happens. When most of your money goes into your headshots rather than <laughs> your recording equipment, yeah, there's an yeah. issue. There, there, it used to be that, to, and we'll say in this current, you know, boom in the paranormal, it used to be that all you needed to, to be a paranormal investigator was a notebook, mm -hmm. maybe some sort of camera or, or a tape recorder, and a brain. 
That's what you needed. And now you don't really need those things. You just and need permission. A, you just need a Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> you, now you just need a Facebook page. Yeah. And uh, sure. you know, I've seen so many people who have kind of become, you know, legends in their own mind because they get the hits on Facebook or they have the followers on Twitter, and it, it's almost like it validates them to do that. Now, you probably know a lot of the same people that we know. They're great people. They're great investigators. They're far from being celebrities. Mm -hmm. They're just not the personality that would have that anyway. But because they're in a field that is people are paying so much attention to, they feel that they're included with the in crowd of that field. Yeah. Like I'm sure you get I'm sure you get instances, you know, not as much as maybe Jason and Grant, but you get people mm -hmm. who are like, uh, you know, you might take a day before you haven't logged into Facebook because you've been busy. So somebody's friend request has gone unanswered for maybe 24 hours mm -hmm. and then you all of a sudden find out they're writing about you on a message board like oh, what a snotty person she wouldn't even accept my friend request on facebook well maybe they are i don't i don't have so much time to monitor that <laughs> stuff but yeah i know i know what you're talking about there's people invest a great deal in this and i talk a little bit about that in my book that why do we do this you know well i mean i mean i know why you guys do it you know there's a history with investigation and with the community, with the field. But a lot of people get into this and, you know, everyone's like, well, we're in it because we want to promote the field. And mm -hmm. indeed, there are many, many people who do. But I think people are in it, to be honest with you. So a lot of people are in this because they have nothing else exciting going on in their life. Yep. And they see it on TV. And it's, it, it's a way to be socially cool. There's now, it's a social marker to be a, a paranormal investigator. And, um, People do get a sense of personal legitimacy in this. They feel personally validated and socially validated because of their involvement in this community. And we have about 12 minutes left in this first hour. So in the next hour, I really want to get down to, to breaking down who it is that makes up the paranormal community because you did a, 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 very, uh, a very good, very comprehensive survey in preparation of this book. And I want to kind of break into some of the... Um, uh, almost stereotypes in a way of who's who makes up the paranormal field. So we'll do that next hour. I also want to talk to you more too as well about your own set of beliefs and how that influences you as an investigator and how it influences how people perceive you uh, as an investigator. But in staying with the idea of these, uh, you know, television shows popping up there, I don't think that I've known a paranormal group, you know, that hasn't at least been... Uh, somewhat involved in media to a degree. Like, even if they're just sharing with me, you know, what it is that happened, they're sharing it with the media. I mean, granted, we're doing yeah, it as a friendly yeah. colleague type of thing, but still. So I find I, it, there's just so much of this disingenuousness of people who say, uh, you, know, you know, I'm doing this for the real research. I'm doing this for the research of it. But yet they're also the ones that are mad because somebody else is getting a TV show when they're not. Yeah, yeah. You're, that's a great way of looking at it. Um uh, Again, then there's this focus, like, do you really focus on going out and doing investigations and doing real client-based work, or do you focus on, you know, answering that email from some production company that, yep. yeah, I mean, it, it's really a very surreal dynamic. And, I've, I mean, I'm guilty of answering those emails i mean but <laughs> then again I, I try to try to fulfill that you know role of and i, I don't look at it as like jason and grant mm -hmm. do necessarily or john zaffis where they're like you know we're an ambassador for the for the field i look at it more as either okay they want me to go and tell my story about what happened here either i can go tell it and yeah. i know that when i go tell it i'm going to tell it truthfully or i can let somebody else go and tell it and who knows what it's going to become but you're a journalist you're doing this as a profession that mm -hmm. you, for, for somebody like you it's expected yeah, I mean, I have to mean, if I don't keep my journalistic integrity with this show and with what I do in the paranormal, then who's going to believe me when I go yeah. and cover a news event or a sporting event? Yeah, well, there's nothing wrong with engaging entertainment culture. And as I point out in my book, the paranormal, America's fascination with that and public culture, they've always been conjoined. In fact, I say they've always been married. It may, maybe it's never, it's not always a good marriage, but it's, a, it's almost like a relationship. So you can't ignore it. You can't ignore that dynamic, but I think we, you know, if you are really a paranormal investigator and someone invested in the field, not the community so much, but the field, you have to really know the place of, of entertainment culture in mm -hmm. all of this and, 
And if you're smart enough, you can use it in very productive ways. Now, I'm just going to point out something that just popped up in the chat room on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. And that would be, there's a comment in there when we had mentioned, when I just mentioned John Zaffis about, you know, it says, John, LOL, John Zaffis, don't get me started on that show. Mm -hmm. And that's, I find that to be interesting because here's a guy who is basically, you know, the mentor to so many people in this field, a guy who right. posts his phone number up on his website and invites anybody to call him with any help they need. And he tries to be available and tries to be a resource for everybody. But the comment reflects on don't get me started on that show. Now, his television show has superseded his reputation of who he is as an investigator. And it, isn't that amazing? He's been around for so long. And that, because let's face it, that show, not that good. If you're a paranormal investigator, you yeah. know, that show makes you cringe. Yeah, but it's a TV show. Sure. And if you want to be entertained by a TV show it, about the paranormal, it does a great job of that. It makes a guy that's been doing this 30, 35 years look like Fred Sanford of, you know, the paranormal. Nothing yeah. wrong with that, dummy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, going around, you know, but you, you get what I'm saying. You, yeah. You're, you're twisting a... Um, a, a person that's been respected for a number of years and turned him into a character. Mm -hmm. John helped me with my book. Yeah, well, well, he's you know, John, me at some point, yeah. John, you know, John is really a wonderful person. I mean, he he is. You know, he's been around for a while, and, and as you said, he has mentored so many people. Um, but that is something that happens when you agree to go on TV and you're not, you don't have full power over how the project is represented, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. That is the price one pays. See, and the, the shameful part of this, well, not shameful, but the shame of it is that if all these people within the field who bitch and gripe and complain about mm -hmm. those who go on television, if they could actually see the contractual paperwork that yes. people have to sign to be part of this, they might have... A different opinion about the people that signed that now maybe they might say well then you shouldn't have signed it but then again you know if you have that opportunity you're going to take it too. The, I mean I've countless times we've done things where we sign the waivers and we sign the release forms for them to use our evidence and we will put in there stipulations that this evidence was actually not captured by us but we've been given permission to use it, and we would like mm -hmm. to have permission given to the, uh, like to have attribution given to the group that captured it. And it has happened once. Problems. It has caused problems. It hasn't happened once. Not underneath it when it's being shown on screen. Not in the credits at the end. Not yeah. even a thank you in the production notes on the DVD or anything. You know, it's yeah. It's just a matter of, and and why should they? Why should a television company care about who got it? They only care about who brought it to them. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Well, it's going to be a fun second hour, that's for sure. <laughs> because we've already got the, the chat room has been rolling with a lot of conversation about this. We want to take your calls as well. We do have one call on the line here, which I'm going to take. We have about six minutes left. And uh, I didn't mean to ignore this person, but the things were just rolling so well. So uh, good evening. You are on Spooky South Coast with Deanna Kelly Saeed. How are you doing? Hi, it's Keith. Please don't ignore me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Keith. How can we ever ignore Keith Johnson? How you doing, guys? Very All good. Right. How are you? Hey, Keith. Good. Hi, Diona. How you doing? I really loved your book. Oh, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and um, I'd like to say it's a, a really good read. Diona's book is a really good read, and um, you want to know uh, a lot about what goes on behind the scenes, um, whether you're a seasoned investigator or you're just starting in the paranormal and you've got your Facebook account up there. And uh, this is a good book to read to see... Uh, you know, kind of the other side of it, behind the curtain, so to speak. You know what I mean? Sure. Well, Keith, you've had, you know, experiences on a couple of different television shows, uh, including yeah. right at the very beginning with Ghost Hunters. And, I mean, do you feel like that sometimes when people are, are criticizing those who are involved in these shows that they, they don't have the complete story? Well, right. They don't really. Like, like somebody criticizing John, I mean, having pretty much started out the same, John and I kind of started out together, like... Uh, close to four decades ago, and um, now the TV show, if, if anybody knows John only from the TV show, well, that's not an accurate uh, concept, so to speak, of all that John's about. But then again, you've got it broadcast, you know, to millions and millions of viewers across the country, and sometimes this is their first exposure to uh, the paranormal and to John, and that's just one example, you see. Yeah, and I hope that... For all the people who are now just discovering John, you know, it's kind of sad that they may not ever know his full story. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and they won't they won't know you know just how many people that he's influenced because he's come kind of at the later stages of this paranormal reality craze and they don't realize that there would not have been a ghost hunter say jason and grant without them there wouldn't have been uh, a, a paranormal state without the contributions of his aunt and uncle ed and lorraine warren mm -hmm. you know that it's all just you know it's it's kind of like reading the first couple chapters of the bible this person begat this person begat this person yeah hmm. yeah hmm. So, right. yeah, if we can just get people to, to respect that history, then maybe they won't have as much animosity toward the people uh, who are out there getting it done. Yeah. We're just going to have to tell the whole story. That's it, you know? You know, and it's ripe for there to be a behind-the-scenes documentary film made about paranormal reality television. And I don't I know why nobody's tried to do that yet. Well, there, there was a film, there was a TV movie years ago based on a book called Prey TV when uh, TV evangelism was really big, so... Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do that about paranormal TV. You know, I'm sitting here right across from a filmmaker, so there you go, Andy. It's on the word. I think I think we now need to have a a a, a comedy spoof on paranormal reality TV. We were already there. Already there. Yeah, <laughs> all right, you can address a lot of these issues through that form as well. Well, that's something I want to talk about too in the next hour. I want to talk about South Park and how that might have been the. Uh, you know, that might have been the landmark moment in paranormal reality television. So we'll talk about that in the second hour. But, Keith, we want to thank you for checking in. Sure. Take care, guys. Take and care, Deanna. We'll, we'll talk to you thank soon. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Keith. Bye-bye. And, of course, Keith is a featured uh, guest, along with his brother Carl, at the Slater Mill event that we're doing on April 21st. Here we are chastising people for making money off the paranormal, but you can buy your tickets to Legend Trips <laughs> Graveyard Shift at Slater Mill event by going to legendtrips.com. And there's, uh, there's tickets available. There's good hotel deals available. It's all right up there on the page at legendtrips.com. So there, we'll put in a little plug. because. And actually, you know, we, we say all the time, like, every year we have to come on the air and beg. It's like PBS. We have to beg for donations to keep the show going because we don't make money doing this. We, we have to spend money out of our own pockets to keep it going. And this is the first year where we didn't have to go on the air and in six years where we didn't have to go on the air and beg for people to, to help us keep it going. So, you know. It works hand in hand. So mm -hmm. we're going to take a break for the news. When we come back on the other side, we're going to talk more with our guest, Deanna Kelly Saeed, about the book Paranormal Obsession. In the meantime, during the break, go to her website, DeannaKellySaeed.com. It's also linked up on the front page of SpookySouthCoast.com as well. And uh, you can also read her work on GhostVillage.com, as well as follow along with her on social media, Facebook.com slash Deanna K. Saeed and Twitter.com slash Deanna Saeed. And those are both linked up to the Spooky South Coast pages uh, on Facebook and Twitter as well. So there you go. Uh, check that out. It's a little uh, extra reading and a little extra web surfing to do during the news break. We'll be back in just a few minutes to talk more about Paranormal Obsession, America's Fascination with Ghosts and Hauntings, Spooks and Spirits, and we're going to get into the real meat and potatoes of just who makes up this paranormal community coming up in just a few minutes when we come back with more here on Spooky South Coast. First, with local news, talk, and sports, this is WBSM New Bedford, AM 1420, WBSM, a cumulus station. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Sievertson. ABC News projects Mitt Romney, the winner of the Nevada Republican Presidential Caucuses, with a tight race for second between Newt Gingrich and Ron Paul. Romney's appeared to a cheering crowd at his Las Vegas campaign party in the past half hour. That's where ABC's Alex Stone is now with a live update. And Chuck, this is a very enthusiastic crowd here. They just heard from Romney, who focused much of his speech tonight on the economy, which hits so close to home here in Nevada, where they are hurting. America needs a president who can fix the economy because he understands the economy, and I do, and I will. It was a very loud crowd while he was up there. The second place standing in this race is still too close to call between Ron Paul and Newt Gingrich. Gingrich is planning to hold a news conference tonight, a rare move on the night of a race. Chuck? Live from the Romney campaign in Las Vegas, ABC's Alex Stone. Knocking out electricity to thousands of homes, that big winter storm barreling east from Colorado. In Nebraska, they're shoveling this snow. A foot and five inches fell in Denver, a record for a single storm in February. Thunderstorms and heavy rain are expected in the southeast as the system moves in. China and Russia blocked a U.N. Security Council resolution that called for an immediate end to the deadly crackdown on protesters in Syria. Marvin Muashar with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I don't see this as the end of the road, and I don't see the international community uh, being able to remain silent uh, if we see more killings 
on a daily basis at uh, the rate that we are. Car buyers will likely pay more for new and used cars this year as the economy improves. That's according to the National Automobile Dealers Association, predicting the average price of a new car will rise 6% to $30,000. Used car prices will jump as much as 8% for pickups and SUVs. Used cars are in tight supply because so few people bought new cars during the recession. You're listening to ABC News. Castro Edge, the official motor oil sponsor of the NFL, knows you have the strength to perform. So when you buy five quarts of Castro Edge or any other Castro product, you'll get an official NFL hat for the team of your choice free by mail. Yeah, any team. Even if your team went 2-14 and 14 this season, you're still a fan. And right now at Advance Auto Parts, a five-plus quarts jug of Castro GTX conventional motor oil and filter are just $20.99. At Advance, we don't do anything just part way. We go full throttle. We don't just sell you oil. No, we work hard to bring you great deals on oil. So if someone tries to tell you Advance doesn't have a great deal, well, get your team doctor to give him an examination. Because he's on another planet, man. Buy five quarts of Castrol Edge or any Castrol product and get an official NFL hat valued at $25 free. Service is our best part. Advance See store for details. After yesterday's threats against the U.S. and Israel, a show of force by Iran, ABC's Jeffrey Kaufman in London. Called an overt flexing of muscle, Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard holding naval exercises this weekend. At the same time, the Iranian army is involved in ground exercises. The focus, the Straits of Hormuz at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. Iran has repeatedly threatened to close the Straits in retaliation against sanctions that have squeezed Iran's oil exports. The Navy says eight sailors have been discharged for a hazing incident. The Navy says the eight are accused of assaulting a fellow sailor aboard a San Diego-based amphibious assault ship in January as part of an initiation rite, and the assault was videotaped. The victim was treated for injuries. Six sailing, not smooth sailing, for many aboard two Princess Cruise Line ships, a stomach virus. One's newly arrived at Port Everglades at Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The other is due in tomorrow. Nearly 200 passengers and crew members of the Crown Princess and the Ruby Princess came down with norovirus. Maritime expert Bob Jarvis says it may be unfortunate, but it's not uncommon. It's a naturally occurring condition. There really is nothing that the lines can do uh, to prevent it. There have in lawsuits, for the most part, they've been unsuccessful. The best way to prevent it, wash your hands. If you do get sick, you may not get a refund, but Jarvis says most cruise lines will give you something, maybe a discount on a future cruise. Daria Albinger, ABC News. This is ABC News. Do you have unfiled tax returns or owe the IRS or state more than $10,000? If you don't take action now, your tax problem is only going to get worse. Seizure of property, bank levies, wage garnishments, and potential criminal prosecution. Call the experts at U.S. Tax Shield for help at 1-800-334-5070. Our tax advisors will review your case for free, inform you of your rights, and give you a guaranteed quote. And we have an A-plus rating with the BBB. So get protected. Call U.S. Tax Shield now at 1-800-334-5070. Chuck Severson, ABC News. This is Jack Peterson with the latest featured animals up for adoption at the Forever Paws Animal Shelter in Fall River. Carol and Nina are two cats up for adoption. Carol, a four-year-old attractive black cat who entered the shelter three years ago as part of a hoarding case. Living in a cat room for three years is long enough. Over the years, her personality has developed into a quiet and reserved young lady. She needs love, human stimulation, and would be a good couch companion. Nina is a five-year-old who's an adorable brown, gray, and black tabby who's been at the shelter over a year. She's relaxed, loves attention, and can be happy spending time alone. Currently, Forever Paws hosting an overcrowded cat sale. The regular adoption fee of $100 has been reduced to $30 for any cat that's been at the shelter for a year or longer. Both cats qualify for this special. For more information, call the shelter at 508-677-9154 or visit the website foreverpaws.com. A picture of Carol can be viewed on this site.
Ranger Station, Ranger speaking. Yeah, hi. I'd like to report a bear sighting. Location? Uh, in the woods, just outside of town. Oh, not surprising. You've got your home. Bears have theirs. Yeah, but see, this wasn't just any bear. This bear was wearing jeans and a hat, as in a smoky bear. Jeans and a hat, that's definitely smoky. What exactly did he have to say? Well, we were about to... Hey, everybody, let's go, let's go. Ho, ho, ho. Welcome, everyone, to West High School Spring Fling. All right, I've gone through all the tracks. Just move through the beats. Do your thing. All right, everyone, let's hear it for West High's own Brooke Turner, a.k.a. DJ Hook. Scratching at my first school dance takes confidence. <laughs> so we're getting into college. I've got what it takes. Okay, I went through the practice sessions. I slept good. I feel good. We will now begin the test. Please take out your pencils. I got this. We're all good at something. Maybe it's breakdancing, or skateboarding, or video games. Whatever you're good at, you had the skills to make it happen. And those same skills will help us get to college. Visit knowhowtogo.org to learn what you should be doing right now to prepare for college. Start taking the steps at knowhowtogo.org. I've got what it takes. So do you. Brought to you by the American Council on Education, Lumina Foundation, and the Ad Council. This is the story of Dan. supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. AM 1420 WBSM presents Spooky South Ghost with your hosts Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Welcome back. Hour number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with the science advisor, Matt Moniz, and along with Andrew Lake of Greenville Paranormal Research as well. The silent assassin, Matt Costa, had a late night at work, so we, we hope that he's out. We hope that he's kicked back, relaxed, and listening to the second hour of the show here because we're going to talk some more with our guest tonight, Deanna Kelly Saeed, about her book, Paranormal Obsession, America's Fascination with Ghosts and Hauntings, Spooks and Spirits. Uh, right before we get into that, I want to thank everybody out there. Last week, we put the word out. We asked you to help us save one of our favorite restaurants, South Coast Coney's in Middleborough, and we did. They live on. Yay. So the cool part about this, what, what this means for, for Spooky South Coast fans is now that they're still in business, we're going to have a hot dog eating contest, an actual Spooky South Coast hot dog eating contest. And uh, we're, gonna, we're still working out the details. But basically, you're going to take on the spooky crew in basically the most, I don't know, like non-competitive eating contest ever. <laughs> because I'm thinking like I can go four, maybe four hot dogs. I mean, I know I'm a big guy. and People think that I eat a lot. I think I can maybe do four hot dogs. But I've got some friends that are coming down for this. I got somebody that's coming from Connecticut who wants to take part. You know, folks from Wareham who want to take part. And they're planning on going serious hardcore, you know, dipping the, the buns in water and yeah. soaking them down like Kobayashi and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I, I can get that far, but I, I know that um, for the most part, South Coast Coney's are extremely good and I want to savor every bite. So I may fall behind pretty quickly. But I'm hoping I can at least eat a night, eat enough to get myself on the wall. That would be cool. So uh, stay tuned to SpookySouthCoast.com and to my Facebook page and to our Twitter account, and we'll have all the details as it comes, uh, comes together. I know Jeff Belanger is going to come down and take part in this. He says uh, he, he thinks he can pack away a pretty good amount of hot dogs. Oh, Jeff will out-eat out all of you. I hope so because, um, you know, it's always those skinny guys that I win, know. so I was going to put my money down on him. <laughs> you should see him put away chicken wings. Oh. I've seen I've seen him eat some chicken wings, and uh, Moniz is no uh, slouch when it comes to chicken wings either. Yep. So, uh, but uh, it's going to be fun. It's, it's going to be cool. We're going to try and come up with some different categories, you know. So it's not just straight how many hot dogs you can eat. Maybe how many coney dogs can you eat? And uh, they have this ridiculous. You know, Costa was talking last week about the devil dog, and that it turns out that one is covered in jalapenos. Oh. But they also have one that's coated with something called the death sauce. Uh 
I've got some of that at home. So we're going to try and see how many death sauce hot dogs you can eat, too. You know, the winner of that might only eat two. But it's, you know, it's going to we're going to find different ways to work it in for everybody. So, you know, um, America may be obsessed with the paranormal, Diana, but we're going to have them obsessed with hot dogs. By oh, the you time guys have all the over. fun up there. You know, you're welcome to come up and join us anytime. Well, I'm actually going to be road tripping up in New England in about two weeks. Well, let us know. We'll uh, we'll take you to the to the paranormal TV <laughs> capital of the world, the Lizzie <laughs> Board and Bed and Breakfast. Because uh, that's, that's exactly what I need. That's uh, that's where a lot of these shows. That's where all of our television opportunities have come from. Really, mm-hmm. it seems like every time somebody's focusing on Lizzie Borden's, you know, we get the call because we've had profound experiences there. But you know, we're I, I'm probably you know part of uh, what people make up the paranormal field. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm kind of a regular average Joe type of guy. I like to think of myself that way. Matt Moniz, you know, totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also part of the paranormal field as well. And Andy, if you looked at him, you'd think he was a regular normal person. Till you start talking. Till you start him. talking to him. So it's but it's just you know, we're three different types of personalities, but we all fit and we all come together within this field. And of yeah. course, Diana, you being uh both a woman and a Muslim and a southerner, which, you know, that's enough that alone is hard for some people to overcome. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh when you're combining all these things together, uh, you know, we, it's really a diverse field, but yet there's so many common strains throughout it. Yeah, and that's one thing that's quite amazing about the paranormal field. You know, we hear about paranormal drama, and we can disagree over the stupidest things. But in terms of diversity, it really is one of the most tolerant communities you will ever be in. You know, you will have a Muslim investigating with, like, a, a psychic and a vampire and a bisexual and then a catholic priest all on one team and, and, and they all get along and they, they and not they, only do they investigate but they all go out for breakfast together afterwards yeah yeah and so with some pagans in there too and everyone's one big happy family when it comes to diversity so in that sense the paranormal community is quite extraordinary but that being said there are some i don't want to say alarming um factors in who makes up the paranormal community mm-hmm. but there's there's definitely some some things that are almost like red flags to me about who, the, the, about the socioeconomic background of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, I mean, I've said this on the air before, and again, I'm saying this as an, obs- as an observer, and I'm not saying this as any kind of insult or any kind of slight toward people, but I'm a sports writer, and I got my start as a sports writer in 1998 because when pro wrestling was at its peak, uh, at its peak of popularity, uh, there used to be a wrestling column in our local paper, and it was written by a national writer. And some weeks, you know, because he was a real sports writer and didn't just focus on wrestling all the time, some weeks he wouldn't write a column. So I wrote an email to the sports department and said, "Hey, listen, if this guy's not going to give you a column, I'll give you one every week. I'll give it to you for free." And I actually did. I wrote two years for free for this paper. But um, you know, I, I f- was fully ingrained in the wrestling community, both in my local area and kind of nationally, and. I've noticed that as the popularity of wrestling waned, it just so happened that the peak of the paranormal started to happen around the same time. And what you have is a lot of crossover audience. The people who were the wrestling fans are now the paranormal fans. And I'm saying this, and again, not to insult people that like these things, but you see the lowest common denominator of people are kind of drawn to what these uh, fads are in pop culture. I mean, is that kind of bared out from your research as well? Well, um, to a degree, yes. You know, I conducted a anonymous online survey as part of research for this book where 172 self-identified paranormal investigators, and I say that because, you know, there's no qualification process for this. Mm-hmm. Everyone sort of self-identifies. Uh, took this took this questionnaire, and it was supposed to be anonymous, and the questionnaire really looked at what people's um, what people felt, you know, their their educational background, um, their level of education, their current employ- the industry they were employed in, and as well as what they feel is valid evidence. Do they watch the shows? Things such as that. So just trying to get a sense of who is doing this. A state of the paranormal field survey is what I called it, and it was a uh, an attempt to uh, collect qualitative data. It was not scientific or statistical statistically significant in any way. I want to point that out. It was just an attempt to collect basic data. 
And I did find from my research that, you know, unfortunately, we say that we're doing science, but there's not a lot of people with even complete college education in this field. There's very few people with uh, advanced degrees or graduate degrees. That does not mean that they're not good investigators. And I will say some of the best investigators I've ever met are people who, you know, have not had a college education. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean that because anyone has the ability to critically think. But in general, you know, we we want, I think, what the, the uh, dialogue is, we want, like, the scientific community to take it seriously, but a lot of, we don't have the people in the field doing ghost hunting who can really bridge that gap, you know, create those inroads into those communities. It, you're making the assumption that a degree is the means in which it becomes valid. It's, That's a good it's, point, yeah. It's the methodology. Uh, yes. I, I work as a scientist for a living, and I can tell you that using scientific methodology is all you need. The piece of paper is mm-hmm. uh, actually just a piece of paper at that point. As long as you're performing it in a scientific manner, it, you could be, you know, a horse stable shoveler for all, for all that matters. And as long as you're doing it in, in the appropriate method, that's well, all. That ma- I, the question is how many people understand what is the appropriate method. And one thing I point out in the book, and this is something that was pointed out to me by a university professor who does this quietly, that we talk about what we're doing as science, because we've seen them talk about it on ghost hunters, but we know what's happening on ghost hunters is not science. There, there we need to distinguish between a scientifically valid investigation and a technically valid investigation, and those two are sometimes very different things. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I think that, too, you know, when you look look, look at it like this, I'll, I'll kind of put like a sports metaphor mm-hmm. into it uh, to some degree. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, professional basketball, which existed for, you know, 40, 50 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, city street ball comes into play where the rules are different. And it's a really loose interpretation of what basketball is. Uh, you have, uh, you know, even more recently, say, in, in keeping in the wrestling theme, you know, you have NFL football, and then all of a sudden you have the XFL, where it has like a loose identity to what it is that comes before it. And I think that that's kind of what the science aspect is of the paranormal, is it sounds good, and it's it's almost like where the amateurs that are getting involved in the professional field, and so it has some semblance enough. We use a lot of the same terminology, mm-hmm. but the game isn't really the same. There's no standardization yeah. to it. That's part of the problem. That's why yeah. it doesn't become a full-fledged science is because there isn't a standardized methodology to be used. I mean, you can use all the critical thinking. You can use all mm-hmm. of the uh, other devices you use in the science. But if you don't map it out and everybody agrees to follow mm-hmm. along the same lines, you know, or accept that we move point A, B, C, D, E, and check each point as we go along, and we all agree that these are the points that is A, this is the point, this is B, C, and D that we proceed then you're not going to have any recognition by the scientific community because it has mm-hmm. to be repeatable and standardized. That's what makes science. Yeah. You know, well, well, am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. And that's one of my biggest complaints is that we're not creating even a, a basic body of literature, even in our reports. You know, we're not really just writing down what we're doing or the equipment that we're using – like, for goodness sakes, the Lizzie Borden house, how many people have investigated that place? You know, I mean, it would be nice, and maybe something like this does exist, if there was a questionnaire that at least we knew what recorders are picking up EVP, for example. You know, and I'll, I'm going to throw you under the bus a little bit on this one, Matt Moniz, because mm-hmm. you're a chemist by trade, and you write lab reports every day. And, you know, you should have a binder, and I'm not saying that you don't, I'm just saying this, you know, I'm, okay. I'm picking on you here. But you should be I have an electronic it. folder with this stuff. I've you, done it. That's but you should be writing, and uh, if, you, if we need scientific documentation and we need to have standardization, you should be writing a lab report of every single paranormal investigation that's done that you're a part of. And, and that's what these groups should be doing. They should be writing yeah. not a blog on their website. They should be writing a scientific lab report. I mean, I know you're not well, going... I, I, 
No, you're right. I mean, it doesn't have to be a scientific lab report, but there needs to be some body of literature that is archived and compiled, particularly for these historic sites that are to be investigated over and over and over again. We will never have a moment in history where so many people are coming through to investigate. And granted, not all teams are, you know, really collecting great evidence or doing it, doing a great job. But, you know, what if 100 years from now we have all these things compiled and then someone comes back and they're like, oh, my goodness, you know, 60% of these groups over a period of 10 years were experiencing very similar behavior in one particular location, then that becomes really, really cool evidence. No, instead, what, our, what serves as our quote-unquote lab report, what serves as our documentation is, hey, did you see that segment I did on most terrifying places in America? Yeah. Or yeah. Did, you, did you catch that place on Ghost Adventures? You know, these television shows have become the documentation of what's been going on, and we're allowing that to be... It's become mm -hmm. the peer review. And we're allowing exactly. it to be construed in yeah. somebody else's hands that weren't there. Public yeah. peer review. Like, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to give away details. I can't give away details. But I've been in discussions with one of these shows all week long, and they've been calling me about the evidence. Now, this program that I've been working with is more diligent than anyone that I've ever dealt with. And they've been talking about, you know, finding out who owns the footage. You know, can we yeah. show it? What were the circumstances of the footage? Was it the same night? Was this going on the same time as this? You know, they really want to get the true story of it. And I'm impressed by that. But I also know in the back of my mind that when it all comes together and it's edited, it's not going to accurately reflect the fact that they were so interested in getting it right. Yeah, you know, and one thing, this is what I've, I talk about this in my forthcoming book a little bit, the need for us to really be very careful in at least documenting what we're doing, documenting our, our, our methodologies on investigation, documenting as much as we can, because that's mm -hmm. really the very first step, and at least we can do that. And I would love, love for there to be a place we could, art, like if a university could archive some of these things, so that, you know, 50, 60, 100 years from now, there is at least somewhere where this has been kept, mm -hmm. even if it's location specific. Even if you know every investigation that's done at Fort Mifflin, if we could archive reports from there, you know, it just something. I mean, I know it's probably never going to happen, but no, because people that are in this, uh, so uh, many of the people that are in this aren't doing it for the research and for the wealth of. You know, mm -hmm. information that can be happening. They're in it because they want to do it because it's a cool thing to do, or they want to do it because they want to get on TV. They're not doing it for the documentation, but there should be enough people that are doing it for that yeah. right reason that you can at least yeah. get something. You would hope, but it's it's tedious, and I think that you know people don't get it how tedious it is. And I have to point out when you go to a client-based investigation, your responsibility isn't always to science. You have to yes. go in as a critical thinker, but your responsibility is making that person feel more comfortable in their home. And I'm, and I'm putting together my, my next book, and one of the things that I'm focusing on with it is, you know, I, I hate to slap people in the face here with this, but you're probably never going to get science to accept what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they're especially not going to accept what you're doing if you're running around in the dark going to somebody's house. And it's, it's just the way that it is. And just deal with yeah. it. So maybe we need to start getting away from having it have to be science and kind of create our own guidelines, our own terminology, create our own, you know, basically create our own science or instead of relying on the scientific method and relying on, you know, what it is that the, the lab coats, you know, with the exception of Moniz's lab coat, which is tie-dye <laughs> anyway, but <laughs> what the lab coats want us to think and kind of just do it amongst and for ourselves. That's a very good point. And we also probably need to drop the word scientific legitimacy and, yes. and open it up a little bit more to academic legitimacy because we're not really talking about numbers and figures and, and repeatable experiments here. What we're dealing with is something much larger. We're dealing with, you know, psychology and, and sociology and even maybe neurology and biology and environmental factors. You know, we're dealing with an, many, many different variables that may all play a part in paranormal uh, experiences, and it's not just about science. I mean, at some level, we're also dealing with metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very hard to say this is just a science. And also, it's we're also dealing with what is people's own feelings, people's own, you mm -hmm. know, if, if, if a ghost is the still existing soul of a once-living person, and 
damn me for doing this for all this time that I've been doing it. I'm still not ready to accept that. But if that is the case, then you're dealing with something that is no more different than if you're uh, a doctor trying to take the temperature or trying to, uh, you know, put a stethoscope to the chest of a living human being. Unless that subject is willing to play along and allow you to do it, it's not going to happen. So it's not like you're dealing with, you know, gravity, which is there and is always there. You're dealing with something that is dependent on human nature, even if that person may no longer be human. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there, I mean, there's so many variables to this that we don't know, and I, I agree what we can sort of measure and document we should, like changes in the environment, for example, but there's certain parts of this that's just, that's not Cartesian in nature and isn't going to be calibrated through, you know, an EMF detector. And I want to apologize, Diana, if it seems like I've been soapboxing a little bit too much tonight. It seems, uh, I, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I'm trying to put out my own theories here and not, not talk enough about what's in the book, but I, it, it's rare that we can actually have this discussion with somebody else instead of just amongst ourselves where we, we walk out of here feeling like, oh, boy, I bet we pissed off a lot of people tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I value real conversation, and we need to have more of it, you know, to be honest with you, because you bring up a good point. And, again, I don't want to offend anyone in the paranormal community. There are some really amazing people in this community, incredibly bright people. But sometimes there is a lack of real, intelligent conversation. Oh, yeah. So when you, when you are able to have it, there's no reason to apologize for it. <laughs> and one of the things that you mentioned in this book, and I'm going to throw out the phone numbers too, by the way, before, uh, before we get too far into this hour, 508-996-0500. One eight seven seven nine nine six fourteen twenty. Email Spooky Crew at SpookySouthCoast.com or the chat room on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com if you want to get involved in the discussion with Deanna Kelly Saeed about paranormal obsession. Uh, but one of the things that you do get into is kind of the breakdown of who these investigators are. Mm -hmm. You know, and at least in the television aspect, we're not seeing a lot of women, even though we know there's a lot of women out in the field. There's some groups that are all women. There's some groups that are founded yeah. by women. You see, with the exception of uh, Steve, what was his last name? Steve Jones, was that his name? From Ghost Lab? Yeah. With, yeah. with, the, with the exception of him, you don't see any minorities. Uh, you know, maybe him and, and Joe Chin would really be the only people outside mm -hmm. of the, you know, Caucasian male. Uh, and then one of the other things that you mentioned is you do talk a little bit about the the you know economic background of the people and how you have people that are spending thousands of dollars on equipment that, are also saying that they're unemployed on your yeah. survey. And then finally, there are, it seems like an odd proportion of people in the field who are not physically fit. That's right. That's very true. And, you know, these things, you know, you always, you don't want to perpetrate stereotypes because we know how diverse the field really is. But it does appear, based on, on my, the data I collected, which is not necessarily statistically valid data, it's all qualitative, Sure. but it does suggest that a lot of people who are involved in this are not currently Okay, employed. astronaut, you're Hold up. Second, You'll be meeting me. with Wish Kid. Br Sorry. Um, and, and we know that the, stat, you know, the status of the economy, uh, what it is right now, is a lot of people who aren't employed. But I was shocked to see how much money people are spending on average to be part of a paranormal group or to do this hobby who also claim to be unemployed. I mean, some of us may be in this room right now. <laughs> we can claim that. <laughs> I mean, that's just the state. I think that's the state of America today, though. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, when you mention the obesity statistics, too, I think yes. that's also a state uh, of America today. And, and But at the same time, we do know that uh, there is a certain crowd that is drawn mm -hmm. to paranormal investigators. I mean, I, I have no problem saying it. I'm kind of a nerd. And a lot of us kind of are nerds. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people that are perceived that way, Andy, don't sit there and shake your head like your Magnum <laughs> P.I. over there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I only was picking on him because he moved first. But uh, <laughs> he was the first one to blink. But uh, there, there is that, that um, stereotype that people have in their minds about who it might be that investigate the paranormal. But I don't think there's any more people that fit that stereotype than there might be in any other aspect of society. I know a lot more nerds who are into sport, and I, I use nerds lovingly, but I know a lot, a lot more sports nerds than I know paranormal nerds. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Well, one thing about paranormal investigation, it doesn't require you to be physically fit. I mean, you're sitting around the whole time. <laughs> Except for those three flights of stairs. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, if you investigate a lighthouse or something, then you may <laughs> oh, God, don't even be in that. for a long night. But, um, yeah, it doesn't require one to be physically fit, to be honest. It's, and, it's, and it's something that anyone can get into. There's a very low threshold, and you don't have to invest a lot of money to get started. So it's accessible to people of all economic uh, income levels. Now, there's another great book that um, a couple of sociologists did based on the data they collected from uh, the Baylor Religion on Survey where they looked at paranormal uh, beliefs as paranormal America. And they, what I found to be particularly fascinating is the, the differences between the ghost hunting community and the Bigfoot hunting community. They found in the Bigfoot hunting community, actually, it was very gendered, uh, predominantly male, but the you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about people who go looking for Bigfoot, or at least there were before that show came on on Animal Planet. Mm-hmm. But um, they found that people who do that tend to be very highly educated and who have, they tend to be hyper-conventional and actually have their upper-middle-income individuals. And to get involved in the Bigfoot community can require more money than getting involved in the ghost hunting community. But for the ghost hunting community, it was a little different. And I found that to be so interesting. And one of the things he touched on, too, is the difference between the parapsychology community and mm-hmm. the ghost hunting community and how there is a, a very big, as much as one, you know, as much as the ghost hunters may use the work of the parapsychologists and may cite the work of the parapsychologists, there's not a lot of um, love and interaction between the two. Not at all. Not at all. And again, it comes up, parapsychology has a real academic legacy. It's rooted in an academic culture. And if you look at their journals, and there are parapsychology journals still today, Journal of Parapsychology, you know, some of these, some of these um, articles are nothing but st- statistics based on lab results. How many ghost hunters can sit down and read that and understand what it, what it really means? I can. I don't have a background in statistics. Mm-hmm. But, you know, how many people do? And you can use that information actively... And, and, and apply it in their in their investigations. Most can't. So where what really can you talk about? Well, uh, not not to put these people on on blast as being the ones who are the ones who were, were saying this, but when you have people who have the notoriety of a Dr. Mm-hmm. Barry Taff, of a mm-hmm. of a Dr. Lloyd Arbach, when you have people who have reached that level within the parapsychology field. Um, they also forget that part of the reason why they've reached that level in the field is because of the media attention that they garnered mm-hmm. in the 70s and 80s on shows like In Search Of and Unsolved Mysteries and Sightings. Yeah. And why did they gain that notoriety? They gained that notoriety because people like Hans Holzer and Harry Price and the supposed out there guys that were getting involved with media when television and radio were still new, you know, they had to be the, uh, you know, the Jason and Grants of their day to get That's the media right. spotlight even thrown on the topic. Yeah, and you're, you know, you're absolutely right. Now, someone like Lloyd Arbach and Barry Taft, they have worked at trying to establish a very strong dialogue with grassroots amateur ghost hunters, because mm-hmm. they acknowledge there are some doing amazing work, and there needs to be some links between the parapsychology community and the sort of amateur ghost hunter community, and, and Lloyd in particular has worked quite extensively on that. But not all parapsychologists are into ghost hunting. Parapsychology is concerned with the study of psi, you know, mm-hmm. psychical ability, and there are definitely overlaps. But, um, but the work of many parapsychologists really affects what we do in our investigation, like the work of William Roll, who recently passed away, Dr. Roll, and his research into PK and uh, psychokinesis and uh, the EMF and psychokinesis and things such as that, you know, that really, whether investigators know it or not, many of them who go out and investigate, you know, they are doing, they're doing what they do because of his research. Yep. They don't know it. And it's kind of funny because if the common person decided to go out and become a mechanic, you know, you'd think that they want to go out and buy, you know, Haynes manuals of how to repair a car or even, you know, get the factory uh, repair manuals from Ford and from Chevy and from Chrysler. Yet you don't, f- you know, go ask a go ask a, a common ghost hunter on Facebook who J.B. Ryan is. Go ask them who Harry yeah. Price is. You know, go ask them who even Barry Taff and Lloyd Auerbach are. Exactly. And you know, they might be Facebook friends with them because everybody else in the paranormal is, but they don't know who they are and what they do. 
Yeah, and, and that there's vast differences between even Lloyd and Dr. Taft. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't agree. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, you're right. There, no one, everyone sort of wants the degree of being a ghost hunter, but no one wants to do the lit review and the dissertation. We actually had a guest, and I'm not going to name any names, uh, but we had a guest not that long ago who came on the air and talk to us about this stuff that's going on and you know all the same type of topics we're talking about tonight and refused to acknowledge that he was a paranormal investigator and chose to instead call himself a parapsychologist because that's what he wanted to be known as not because he had a parapsychology degree not even a matchbook degree which no yeah. offense anybody but come on when Lloyd Auerbach is sending you a certificate in the mail it's a matchbook degree you're not an actual parapsychologist you know you, anybody that sends him the money gets that certificate same thing with anybody else yeah. that's offering these courses so you know you don't even have those qualifications but yet you want to be called a parapsychologist it just shows to me that you have no idea what you're talking about oh and it's, it's actually offensive to me personally I don't know who you're talking about by the way so I I don't want to be responsible or be offensive. What I'm going I'd to say, say, I'd have no problem saying his name, except it, it's completely been taken out of my mind. Well, okay, but I don't know who it is. But you know, parapsychology is a real academic degree, and although there's nowhere in the U.S. you can get a PhD, you can go abroad to the U.K. and get a PhD. I mean, a, a degree in parapsychology. It is an academic field, and you don't go around saying you're a doctor or you're a lawyer or you're an economist or whatever, without getting that degree, without getting that piece of paper. So what makes it okay for people to say they're parapsychologists when they haven't gone through an institution or taken one course? I mean, wh- how, is, how do we accept that as a community? And, and it's really just this person was an outsider to the paranormal community, excuse me, and basically did his research by watching YouTube videos and saying, gee, that looks real, that doesn't look real, that looks real, that doesn't look real, very arbitrarily conducting, you know, compressed video research online and decided that he felt like calling himself a parapsychologist would make him sound more important. So that's the... Yeah, the I, don't, I, I, I don't... Yeah, and I have a hard time. At some of these conferences, people are there being billed as a parapsychologist and they're not, you know, they don't even know what the Ryan Research Center is. They have mm-hmm. no idea what that is. And uh, it, it's funny, too, because uh, I've had so many people tell me that are in this field that say, well, I'm, uh, I'm currently taking online courses at the, uh, the Duke University parapsychology program. Yeah, no, you're not. No. I don't know who it is that you're re- making that check out to, but it's not to Duke yeah. University. Hey, it's Duke's University. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, the Ryan Research Center, they do have courses. Mm-hmm. They do have parapsychology courses. Um, I think you can tele- call in. I, I don't know, some, some of them may be online or whatever, but these are courses anybody can take, and they don't, they're not certification courses. They're just yes. personal enrichment courses. And, and I didn't, I mean, I'm not disparaging either when I mentioned Lloyd Auerbach's courses. I'm not, I'm not disparaging his courses. I'm just saying that they, they, they're, you're, they're coming from Dr. Auerbach. They're not coming mm-hmm. from an accredited university. So you, yeah. you're still going to learn, and you're going to learn a great deal more taking those courses than you ever would just trying to study this stuff up on your own. But I'm just saying it doesn't make you an official doctor to go through No, his, it doesn't. And he's actually, uh, he, we've talked about this, and he's told his students, this is just a certification that you've taken these courses. It does not make you a parapsychologist. I mean, he will flat out tell them that. So, you know, and I, I have a feeling that maybe this person has probably not even taken his courses, the one that yeah. you're referring to. And I'll, I'll tell you something. A lot of people don't know this about me. <laughs> I'm an ordained minister. I'm a reverend. There you go. Because I went to the Universal Life Church website, typed in my name, and they printed me out a certificate that mm-hmm. told me that I was a reverend. Reverend Tim Weisberg. Yes. So I'm a ordained minister of the Universal Life Church. I have no idea what their doctrines or philosophies are, but I am an ordained minister. And this came about because there was somebody in the field that was perpetrating themselves as a reverend. And to do a little bit of research that I needed to do, I went to the website and said, oh, let me just see how easy this is. Tap, 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 done. Yeah, I need to get one of those. I'll be like the first Muslim reverend in the community. Then I'll be really <laughs> yeah, And I'm sure that'll go over well. We, uh, yeah, and, and I should also get, you know, add parapsychologists behind. That'll be everything at that point. You're going to need to get a business card twice the size of what you can get at Staples. Yeah, All right, I well, know. I do want to get into you a little bit about about the Muslim uh, religion and about how that influenced your investigation, but we do have a call right now on the line that I've uh, been waiting, so let's go to that. Good evening. You're on Spooky South Coast with Deanna Kelly Saeed. How are you doing? Oh, I get to say it. 
Excuse me, could you please turn your radio down? Caller? All right. Once, twice, sold. All right, we're gonna, you can call back in if you want. Uh, 508 996 0500. 1 1420. In about 45 seconds, that person's going to be like, oh, wait, that was me. And call <laughs> back. Uh, so we may be. We may be uh, Treading into some uh, ground here where we might have to cut some answers short, but I do want to ask you about being a Muslim and about how that has influenced your your paranormal uh, investigations. You mentioned in the book uh, that you know the paranormal was something that you came into right around the time that that ghost hunters came about. Um, what about your Muslim beliefs? When, when did that come about? Um, well, you mean when I actually became a Muslim? Yes. Or when I... when you started to have. You know, coming from a, a, a Southern background, and uh, I'm sorry, a Southern Baptist background, you know, when did you start to have more leanings toward the Muslim religion? I think I was always very interested in that, you know, the Holy Land, because if anyone grows up in, in the church in America, that's really the first place outside of your backyard that you learn about, you know, the Holy Land. And so I've always been fascinated with that. But I became um, involved with Palestinian activism in college, and that exposed me to Muslims, and these were all like sort of secular, communist sort of kind of Muslims, but they still defended Islam, and the more I learned about it, the more I realized that you, you take away sort of the cultural trappings of Islam, and theologically, it's a, a, a belief system that really adheres to the intellect being the way one understands the world, and the intellect is connected to your heart. So I thought that was quite profound, and I actually became a Muslim when I was 21, officially, became a Muslim when I was 21, and that was the beginning of that particular journey. Now, did you find in, in making that change, uh, did you view other aspects of your life through that Muslim filter, uh, or was it more of nothing really bumped into your belief system like the paranormal would? Um, well, I, I will, so let me, let me preface it this way for the listeners, that one of the most profound intellectual and spiritual journeys of my life occurred when I started coming into the paranormal. And it helped me appreciate Islam more as a religion because it's the only monotheistic religion that really accepts these things, or at least at the conceptual level they accept that these things are, are present, whereas Christianity and, and Judaism may or may not, depending on you know the, who you ask. But... I found it to be completely transformative for me, and many people who get into the paranormal, regardless of their faith or their belief systems, do find it to be very transformative, because you realize the world is more, far more complex than you, mm. than you knew, and that allows you to question a lot of big concepts. But I also am deeply appreciative for other faith systems and belief systems, because I do believe there is truth in all of them, and... Um, a type of truth in all of them, and and I'm. I found that it enriched my own understanding of Islam, but it also helped me link up my what I believe to so many different beliefs, like paganism and occultism and Buddhism and and Christianity. I mean, there's there's a lot of tentacles that really do overlap, and you see it quite effectively sometimes within the paranormal community and the questions we're asking and the things that we're seeking through the work that we do, um, there, is, there is a great deal of commonality. See, the, the problem with the paranormal field, though, is that so many people are looking at it through a Christian lens. Yes. And yes. Those, who believe, those who call themselves spiritual investigators, people who investigate from a spiritual perspective, are unfortunately only looking at it through their spiritual uh, perception. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, I was talking with Jeff Belanger about this not too long ago. That before the reality TV shows, you actually saw more influence of of pagan and occult perspectives in field work. But since you know, since reality TV shows, you're seeing now sort of this scientific work or more of a Christian faith based mm -hmm. type of approach. And there's there are certainly times that's very useful, and I don't want to suggest that it's not. I know. Keith Johnson does wonderful work, faith-based work. But, um, you know, if we're really seeking answers, I, I think we have to consider what pagan perspectives brought to the table and what non-Christian, non-Western perspectives may bring as well, like Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, perspectives and um, 
Islamic perspectives, which most people have no concept about. I don't know. Do you know this one? A Catholic, a Jew, and a Buddhist all walk into a haunted house. And no, it, it just sounds like the setup for a joke. It does. <laughs> what, you mean that's, there's no punchline? No, there, no, but I'll probably come up with one at some point. Oh, well, you should. Yeah. But I, I actually think that I'm not, a, I mean, I'm not a religious person, and I have never had a, a religion. I've never practiced a religion, and I, I'm not really informed about religion. However, I do feel that, you know, religion probably has more of a role in what's going on with the paranormal than hardline science does. Yeah. Uh, I think hardline science has already reached the point where, you know, they've reached an impasse to some degree. Mm -hmm. And religion is kind of the one, you know, extra, you know, when you look at those concentric circles and where they overlap, yeah. you know, I think that the scientific circle is pulling far away from the paranormal to some degree. And I think that religion is starting to move in a little bit closer. I, I believe so too, yeah. Because we're really asking, we're really asking metaphysical questions. And when you go into a client's home, I mean, sometimes there's some really weird stuff going on that you don't, you can't find an answer to. But I think ultimately, it is tied up to larger questions or larger issues within their own life, um, either in the way they're interpreting the events or in the events themselves. So, but then that want to point out in my survey, what I found to be particularly interesting is that the majority of people in the field who responded to my survey do not as associate themselves with an institutionalized religion. They identify as spiritual. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's probably helpful. Um, yeah. But then at the same time, uh, when, when you kind of go into it with that, I don't want to say a blind spiritual approach, but when you go into that with kind of an all-encompassing spiritual approach, yeah. uh, you do find that there is some turnoff factor in that, especially when you're doing a private residence. You know, it, I think it's less important about what the investigator's religious point of view is than it is what the client's religious point mm -hmm. of view is. Exactly. Oh, you're absolutely right. That influences everything. That influences the language they use to discuss it, to how they internalize it, to how they experience it. And that's where that's not science. That's you know theolo that's theology and sociology and anthropology and all of that and psychology and. And, and what what's especially funny about that situation about needing to put that into that filter is when you want to get into the nuts and bolts of what paranormal activity, what a ghost could actually be. It mm -hmm. could be their very own belief system that is the reason why they feel that that's what it is. Just yeah, as much as if they watch paranormal TV has an effect on, you know, w what might actually be going on. Yeah. Well, I, you know, a great example is how um, if you go into a house and, and things are moving around and, you know, a lot of people will immediately... It's frightening. When objects are moving, that, that is frightening. That's quite frightening. Um, and people will, may feel like, well, there's something negative or horrible in my house when it could be, a very, a, you know, a, a psycho a case of psychokinesis where there is a human agent causing that to happen. And that's more of a logical explanation than it being some vaguely demonic force that mm -hmm. might be hanging out in the corner. Um, yeah, but people are, won't think of it that way, won't think of it as being something we're producing with our minds because they don't have that language. They're going to interpret it religiously. What about when objects move when there's nobody in the house? There's been cases of that, too, being possibly related to psychokinesis. But I'm not suggesting that every time something moves that it's somebody doing it with the power of their mind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things move because there's creepy crap going on. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right, sister. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, again, we, have, uh, we probably have about uh, seven or eight minutes left in the show, but I'll throw out the numbers. 508-996-0500, 996 And there's been a bunch of questions popping up in the chat room, but the chat's moving so fast I haven't been able to keep up with it. So if there's any questions to ask in the chat room on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com, feel free to type those in now in the last few minutes. Uh, now, I know that you work with a group called Haunted North Carolina, Deanna, but mm -hmm. do, you, do you also uh, sometimes work with other groups, consult with other groups, and, and try to bring in your belief system and your approach when, when they ask you to? Um, I love working with other groups, actually. I, every opportunity I can, I want to work with another group. I don't assert my belief system on investigations. Um, I just don't. You know, if I felt that I there was a case where someone... It was very specifically related to 
Islamic concepts, then I certainly would. But I, you know, I just don't go into a case asserting. I don't. I go into a case just sort of as a blank slate. You know, sure. I want to see what's going on, and then um, because it's not about what I believe, to be honest with you. Yeah, but uh, but my my question being like, w- you wouldn't be afraid though to discuss your beliefs in the course of a paranormal investigation and to, to bring those into a paranormal investigation. Because I'd love to see what happens when we get a cross-culture of religious beliefs into yeah. one investigation. Oh, no, I'm, that's fine with me. I have no problem doing that. Yeah. Because then we can say, you know, a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim walk into a haunted house, and then we can yeah. actually see what the punchline will be. <laughs> All right, we have we one. To- oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so let's take the call or the question. Okay, we have a, we have a call here, so let's go to that. Good evening. You are on Spooky South Coast with Deanna Kelly Saeed. How you doing? I'm not too too bad. How you guys doing? Oh, we are spectacular. Awesome. Um, the question I had, um, as far as these shows go, and a lot of the researchers that are out there, um, when they're working with clients and stuff, though, do you think that it's really such a good idea for a lot of the people who are kind of like grown up on these shows so much and base their groups and stuff off of what they see on TV, to be able to go into someone's home who's having a problem and start telling them that this is what's happening, this is what's happening, when, in fact, really, we don't really know what's happening. Mm. Yeah, I I mean, I I guess I could answer that. I I think what you're asking is people who are are reared on the TV version of ghost hunting, and they form these groups, and they go in um, to a, a person's home, and the person's sort of bringing them into their private space and they're they're trying to provide definitive answers that that is problematic because a lot of times we don't know what's happening and as we talked about earlier many people don't even they don't know about parapsychology and even religious you know religious and pagan perspectives which some people do find to be very comforting um they're they're sort of spouting out what they see from entertainment culture and really to be honest when we go into someone's home a private home, our job is to make the client feel less haunted because we probably cannot solve the haunting. And I don't know if many people understand that ethically our job is to make these people feel empowered in their space even if we don't have all the answers. Okay, now, where a lot of researchers, um, what they see on TV is these groups go into a house or they go into someone's home and they research in one night because that's what they're seeing. They're not seeing the entire process. They're seeing the edited, watered-down version. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where, in actuality, I mean, how can we hope to go into someone's house and have an answer for them in one night? And is there some sort of a line where we should be drawing in the sand, where we should be telling people, listen, <laughs> what's on TV is on TV, and what's really going on is what's really going on. You mean the clients themselves, that the client should be aware of that? or the, the From the get-go, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I think good ethical teams are will come in and explain what the process is. And I think, I know we do, We from the get-go, we tell them, this is what we do, this is what we cannot do. Like, for example, we don't do spirit cleansings. Um, if a client wants that, we can certainly refer them to people who do, but we can't promise to get rid of something. And we make it very clear to people in the beginning, and I think, I think ethical teams will do that and keep the client informed of the process. And when you talk about research, it's not just going in and doing the investigation. Um, It's also doing the historical research, which can become very, very Mm time-consuming depending on how much you do. I mean, a real investigation in in entirety is not, it's really a long, long process. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank thank you for calling calling in. Look forward to the book. Thank Have you. a good night. All right, yeah, we are coming up on, on just about the last few minutes of the show, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, the upcoming book, So You Want to Hunt Ghosts, a down-to-earth guide, which is coming out uh, in Octo- October of this year. And you mentioned some of the, the things that you're working into that work. Um, is it kind of strange, though, to know that um, a lot of the people who are reading uh, your second book might not be familiar with your first book, but might be very well the people that you're talking about in your first book? <laughs> Yeah, it is going to be very strange. It's a very different type of book. And what the the second book is, it's not necessarily a 101 guidebook, because, I mean, you know, Chris has written a wonderful book that everyone reads about that. But what it gets into is, is looking at emerging ethical and philosophical issues facing the field, 
um, just as he said, you know, ethically, what are our rights and responsibilities to a client? But also, it gets into more of a research design perspective because there's only so many crisis haunted situations out there. I think more and more uh, teams are going to have to do research based cases because, you know, I'm God, not every homeowner has a haunted house. So, how do you actually design that? And I get into things like report writing and documenting and. It's really, it's for, I think, in, there's enough investigators now who are moving on to a, a next level of investigation, and I hope this book helps guide them. I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm not, there are many, many investigators out there far more experienced than I am, but I am a writer, and what I can do is compile information and make it accessible to the reader, and I hope I've done that, and it, it allows people to take their investigation to the next level. Even if you're a legend tripper, there's still certain ethical things that you should abide by Absolutely. when it comes to history yeah and we'll want to have you on to talk about that one when it comes out in the meantime people can follow along with your writings on ghostvillage.com and on your own website as well right yes of course and my twitter is now deanna kelly d-e-o-n-n-a k d-e-o-n-n-a-k-e-l-l-i you can look me up on twitter as deanna kelly facebook deanna kelly saeed there you go, and it's all linked up uh, on my accounts and on SpookySouthCoast.com as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Deanna, and uh, we look forward to talking to you a lot more in the future. I had a lovely time. Thanks for having me. Don't eat so many hot dogs, you guys get sick. <laughs> it's only going to take a few. <laughs> but, and there'll be video. It's going to be on 30-odd minutes. So they'll Yes, be of course. <laughs> all right, have a great night. You too. Bye -bye. Good night. That is Deanna Kelly Saeed, and her, new, her book is called paranormal obsession so pick it up pretty much wherever books are sold and you can also get it on our website deanna kelly com as well and on spooky south coast.com so we are coming up on the end of the show uh we will be back next week uh if i remember correctly our guest will be philip copen which i know matt moniz is looking forward to that episode it's going to be a great show we're going to be talking about well all kinds of ufo stuff and we're going to be talking about plenty of stuff each and every week as we go on throughout this our seventh year on the air so uh there's plenty more stuff coming up as we go along uh, just a reminder again uh legendtrips.com that's where you want to go if you want to buy tickets to our april 21st graveyard shift at slater mill event uh, myself jeff belanger matt andy we're all going to be there along with keith and carl johnson it's going to be a fun night of investigation of dinner of lectures of just hanging out and checking out a really cool property psychics yeah, Psychics. We're going to have Pam Padalano and Tiffany Rice there, so it's it's just going to be a great time. So go and check that out. Get your tickets then because, uh, you know, you missed out to tickets to Dead of Winter, February 25th at Lizzie Boyd and Bed and Breakfast. But don't worry because we're working on some more stuff with that as well. So we'll keep you going. After we bashed everybody in the first hour for making money off the paranormal, we're trying to make ours too. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're just trying to keep the show bless going, America. folks. Yeah, we're, we're just trying to keep this thing rolling every week. So uh, that does it for this week. Until next week. Uh, for Matt Costa, for Matt Moniz, for Andy Lake, for Chris Balzano, I'm Tim Weisberg, and we want you to, all week long, stay spooktacular. And of course, keep checking out SpookySouthCoast.com. A Cushnet, Fairhaven, Dartmouth, and New Bedford. We've got you covered. AM 1420, WBSM. Getting a huge reaction from the crowd by taking on President Obama. Did Obamacare encourage businesses to hire more people? No. Now moving on to Colorado, Romney is expected to have an advantage in that state as well because like Nevada, there is a sizable Mormon population in Colorado. Alex Stone, ABC News, Las Vegas. The race for second place in Nevada is still too t close to call between Texas Congressman Ron Paul and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Not long ago, a defiant Gingrich told reporters he has no intention of dropping out of the race. We have over 160,000 donors, 97% of whom have given less than $250. We have an obligation to them to stand up for their values, their concerns, and the reason they've gotten involved. Gingrich says he intends to stay a presidential candidate right up until the Republican convention in Tampa this summer. All four GOP candidates will now be concentrating on this week's caucuses in Colorado and in Minnesota. Then it's on to Michigan and Arizona, 
which both hold primaries at the end of the month. An angry U.S. ambassador to the United Nations was mincing no words when she condemned both Russia and China for vetoing a draft resolution before the U.N. Security Council that called for the president of Syria to transfer power and end the escalating violence in Syria. The United States is disgusted that a couple members of this council continue to prevent us from fulfilling our sole purpose here. Ambassador Susan Rice said those opposing the resolution will have blood on their hands. The Security Council's vote came as Assad's security forces were being blamed for a violent artillery assault that left more than 200 Syrians dead. You're listening to ABC News. Beat the winter blues with great savings at Rite Aid. Now through March 3rd, you can earn a $20 plus up reward when you spend $100 or more on select products with your wellness